Good evening. Good to see everyone out tonight. Got just a few announcements before we get going. Uh, things coming up here on September the 18th, we'll have a wedding shower for Cody and Linus. Uh, so uh, be uh, planning on that. It'll be right after our morning service and we'll have uh, lunch with it. We'll have barbecue and then there's a sign up sheet out on the foyer for uh, side items to bring with that some buns, some chips, salads, desserts, so you can just sign up for those out front on that. And then tonight, Jay Lyle from Kennett is here with us. Uh, he's going to present our lesson here at the proper time on that. And then coming up September 11th through the 14th, uh, Spencer Furby is going to be here for our spiritual growth seminar, so be planning on that. And then um, while Jay is, is speaking, if you hear something crunch, it may be some peanut brittle over around Beverly's area. I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you can blame him <laughs> on that. So, little side note on that. Uh, prayer updates. Uh, we announced Sunday, uh, Wilford's sister, Barbara Miller, was having some tough time with her chemo treatments. So, need to uh, remember him or her in your prayers. And then Bob Nepian is supposed to have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Uh, with an oncologist to see what else there might need to be uh, done for his situation. And then remember Pauletta Burns, you know, she's having a lot of trouble with her chemo treatments and getting over pneumonia. And then uh, Ron uh, Cravens uh, had his last treatment this past week, so you need to continue to remember him. And Connie's still doing good, and uh, Doris is supposed to be home Sunday on that. So, And then uh, also we announced Sunday, Sarah Dollins. Uh, she has breast cancer and, need, and is supposed to have surgery in September, so need to remember her in your prayers also. Those are the updates I have. Anybody else have anything? Kenny? Finally, at the end, got it mixed right, huh? <laughs> oh. Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, hopefully he'll be able to get back here with us pretty soon then. Anything else? Oh, instead of September, it's going to be Friday now. Okay, so Sarah Dollins' surgery is going to be Friday, so need to remember her. Anything else? Let's pray together. Our great Heavenly Father, as we come together to worship you lord we thank you for the blessings you've given us lord we'd like to ask that you look down upon those that need your help those that were mentioned in the announcements tonight those others that we may not be aware of we pray that you'll be with them their families and those that are attending to them lord lord we'd like at this time to pray for the teachers and the students as school goes back together we pray that they can learn by example, the examples that the teachers put forth through 
the better things in life. Lord, we'd like to pray for this country, for our leaders, Lord. We pray that we can get back on track, that we can look to you, that this was a nation founded under God, that we can return that to the forefront of our lives. Most of all, we'd like to thank you for your son, that you sent this earth to die, that we might have hope and eternal life. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. First song is 684. 684. We'll sing a couple of, a few songs, then uh, we're going to release the younger kids. Where's Billy? Good. Okay, good class. 684. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me to heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. The songs of sweetest praise back from heaven shore and I can't feel at home in this world anymore oh Lord you know I have no friend like you if heaven's not my home then Lord what will I do the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't Feel at home in this world anymore. <clears throat> 627. 627. <clears throat> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. <clears throat> Heaven is near and the way groweth clear, for I'm in the glory land way. Don't drag it, people. Church, now come on. We are happy to be going to that glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wanderers, come home, oh, hasten to obey. 
for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clear for I'm in the glory land way. <clears throat> Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in the home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land way. 756. 756. <clears throat> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. Clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when all say Jesus will sing and shout the victory. And before the lesson and the release to class, number 829. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city 
where the ransom will shine. I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltops in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find there no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder I'll never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as gold. The invitation song will be number 327. 327. We are dismissed to class, and did somebody want to introduce him? or No? I, I guess you get no introduction. He's Jay from someplace. So. I've been called worse. Don't worry. <laughs> Good, evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? I love that you stopped that one song halfway through and told everybody to speed up a little bit. You're not going to do that in my sermon tonight, though, are you? Hey, come on, let's go. I couldn't fault you if you did. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Well, I absolutely love uh, getting the opportunity to come and preach to you. I appreciate that you keep inviting me back most summers. Uh, believe me, not every church does. So that's a good thing. Happy to be here. Uh, love getting to preach for you here at Green Forest. This is a good church. I, I may only be here about once a year, but I know this is a good church. Um, I know Adam. Adam, how long have you been here now? Over 10 years. You don't keep a guy like Adam for over 10 years unless you are a really good church and a wonderful group of people. Uh, so I appreciate you, appreciate the work you're doing here in Poplar Bluff. I appreciate Adam, the service he's providing, and I'm just really thankful to be a, a small part of that tonight. We're going to be in Luke chapter 7. I hope that you have your Bible. You'll turn with me there, and, and we'll read from that in just a few minutes. Gospel of Luke chapter 7. There was a young couple that was engaged to be married, and the wedding day was rapidly approaching. They were getting excited, but both of them were a little bit nervous. Now, this wasn't your normal pre-wedding jitters that most people go through. No, they both had problems that the other one didn't know about, things they had never shared with each other. Well, this groom-to-be decided he was going to go talk to his dad and get his perspective, his advice on things. He talked it over with his father. He said, Dad, I'm worried. I've got a serious problem. 
I love my, my bride to be very much, but I've got a bad problem. You see, I've got really smelly feet. And I'm afraid she's going to find me and my smelly feet disgusting. And she's not going to want anything to do with me. His dad said, I, I hear you, son. That's not a problem. Here's what you do. All you got to do is wash your feet as often as humanly possible. Always wear socks at all times, even to bed. But remember, this is really important. You always have to be the first one out of bed. You got to go straight to the bathroom, wash your feet, put on fresh socks, and guess what? She's never going to know the difference. His son thought, all right, that sounds like pretty good, pretty good advice. Well, the bride-to-be took her problem to her mother. She said, Mom, I love my future husband very much, but I've got a serious problem. See, when I wake up in the morning, my breath smells horrible. And I'm afraid if he ever gets a whiff of my bad morning breath, he's not going to want anything to do with me. Her mother advised, well, here's what you do in the morning. You get straight up out of bed, head to the bathroom, and brush your teeth. But the important thing is you don't say a word until you brush your teeth. Not a word. And he'll never know. Well, she thought that's a pretty good idea. It's worth a try. Well, the couple was finally married in a beautiful ceremony, and things went really well for them for a while. Not forgetting the advice they had received. He with his smelly feet, her with her bad morning breath. Things were going good. But about six months into the marriage, shortly before dawn, the husband woke up, horrified to find one of his socks had fallen off in bed at night. He started to panic. He starts frantically looking for this sock, trying to put it back on. He's throwing covers off the bed and everything. And of course, in his search, he woke up his wife. And without thinking at all, she blurted out, What on earth are you doing? And the husband recoiled in, in shock and horror. He said, Oh no, you, you've swallowed my sock. <laughs> that got a better reaction than it usually does. You guys are a good crowd. All right. Terrible, terrible jokes aside. You are a little bit like them. Admit it. No, I'm not t saying that you have smelly feet or bad morning breath. Don't breathe on me after this. Don't test it out. But that's not what I'm saying. No, there are things about you, aspects of yourself that you try to hide so nobody finds out, right? That's a pretty normal human being thing to do. There are things you've done, or maybe even things you still do, parts of your character, your personality, whatever, things that you try to hide so nobody knows. And if anybody ever found out, well, you wouldn't even dream to imagine what that would be like. And maybe sometimes you even look in the mirror and looking back at you are all of your mistakes, your past, your deepest, darkest secrets. And maybe sometimes you might wonder, man, who could love this mess? How could anybody ever look past all of my failures? How could anybody ever love me after everything that I've done? You know, some people have just a very, very strange picture of who God is. They believe that God is just looking for all those little mistakes we've made, and he can't wait to punish us for all of them. They picture God like he's up there with this like trap door, lever, pull it, and the floor will drop off. We'll go straight to hell, and he'll just laugh and cackle the whole time that he's going to enjoy making us pay for all of our mistakes. That's not who God is. That, that is not who God is. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know it because God perfectly revealed himself in his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.3 says this about Jesus, that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the exact imprint of who God is. He's the perfect revelation of God. And when you look at the pictures of scripture we have of Jesus, he wasn't reveling in punishment. He wasn't happy to deal out condemnation. In his ministry, Jesus was full of forgiveness, and mercy, and grace. Jesus was compassionate. 
And that's going to be on full display in our text tonight. We're in chapter 7 of Luke. We're going to start by reading verses 36 through 39. It says, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her, the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. Well, let's stop there for a moment. We've got three major characters in this text. Of course, Jesus is the main character, but you also have this Pharisee. We'll find out later his name is Simon. And then there's an unnamed woman. We'll get back to her in a moment. Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus over for dinner one day. And from what I can tell, the night seemed to be going pretty good. Almost, I'm guessing exactly how Simon had planned it to go. Jesus, the teacher, was reclining at his table. Everybody in town knew who Jesus was, and they knew Jesus was going to be there eating dinner that night. So Simon got a little bit of bump to his reputation. That looked good on your resume to have Jesus in your house eating with you. Makes for some bragging rights you can share with your friends. Uh, maybe the discussion was even lively that night. Maybe Simon was asking Jesus questions like people tended to do. Maybe Jesus was dropping some really fascinating truths uh, that night. It was a great night to have Jesus in your house. But then things changed quickly. At the drop of a hat, things changed as this party was crashed. And our third character for the night enters the scene. There was a woman from the city who had found out Jesus was at Simon's house. And she decided that she just had to meet him. She had to see Jesus, but there's just one little tiny, huge problem. She was a sinner. Now, we don't know what her sin was. It doesn't say. But it was apparently great. Jesus would go on to say as much, say that her sins are many. And it was clearly well known to everybody there. You see, this woman had a little bit of a reputation. She entered the house. I'm sure all eyes were just glued to this woman as she walked into the room. You can almost imagine the hushed whispers going through the crowd. Maybe not even so hushed. I doubt they really cared what she thought. What is she doing here? Doesn't she know whose house this is? Doesn't she know who's eating in this house? We know what kind of woman this is. Does she have no shame whatsoever? As she walked through the room... She didn't say a word as far as we know. She just made a straight line directly toward Jesus. She stood behind him, right next to him, and produced this container of ointment. What does she think she's doing? This is, is the teacher. This is a great prophet of God. She has no business going anywhere near him. And then she did the unthinkable. She touched him. She actually had the audacity to touch him. Not only that, she kissed his feet. She anointed them with ointment. These weren't the soft, manicured feet of the wealthy and the privileged. No, these were the rough, dried, cracked feet of a traveling creature who walked everywhere he went. But it didn't matter to this woman. She kissed those dirty, filthy feet over and over and over again, weeping the whole time. She let down her hair. She washed his feet with her tears in her hair. Now, why was she crying? What, was it because of her own sinfulness? Were they tears of joy because of the forgiveness she hoped to find out? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Because to everybody around, it didn't matter why she was there. This just simply was not done in public. A woman did not approach a man who wasn't her husband. She certainly wouldn't dare touch him. Not to mention she let down her hair in public for everybody to see. That wasn't done. This woman had no shame. She had no sense of decency. 
Simon the Pharisee noticed. Of course he did. He thought about this woman in his head, what every single one of us would have thought if she had crashed our party unannounced. What does she think she's doing here? Why did she just walk into my home uninvited? How can I get her to leave as quickly as humanly possible? Admit it, that's what you would think about this woman if she came into your house when you were hosting somebody important. But then his thoughts transition from her to Jesus. And he thinks to himself, "Mm, I don't know about this guy. If he were really a prophet like everybody says he is, he'd know what kind of woman this is. He'd know she's a sinner and he wouldn't have anything to do with her with him. He'd tell her to go away, scram, beat it, get out of here, leave me alone. The funny thing is, Jesus did know this woman, didn't he? He knew her very, very well. In fact, he knew her far better than Simon ever could. He also knew Simon's thoughts as Jesus often did. Uh, Jesus wasn't only a prophet. Like Simon had said, he was the son of God. The son of God who had the authority to forgive sins. And the son of God was going to take this opportunity to teach this Pharisee about compassion, about forgiveness, about grace, about mercy. Let's back up into verse 39 again. This time we'll go through verse 43. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus answered, or answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. And Jesus tells a little story. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Okay, this is a really simple little story, but it has such a remarkable meaning. Two men owed the same money lender uh, some money. And this wasn't the friendly banker you might think of. Uh, This would have been somebody probably like a loan shark, somebody who was out to take advantage of the poor, uh, somebody who would charge an outrageous interest rate, somebody who would not be lenient at all on somebody who couldn't pay them back on time. So this wasn't the type of person you wanted to owe money to, but these two men did. In English, uh, because I'm guessing you probably don't talk in denarii very often, in English, one of them owed two months' worth of wages. The other one owed two years. Now, the moneylender did the unthinkable. He canceled both debts. So let's say one of these men was forgiven about $10,000. The other one was forgiven about $100,000. And then Jesus asked a very simple, basic question to Simon. Which one of these two guys would love the moneylender more? I don't know, maybe Simon was even bored by this question. He'd already determined in his head that Jesus wasn't a prophet, right? If Jesus would be near this woman, he clearly wasn't a prophet. And now Jesus was asking him a basic, obvious question. So Simon answered, I suppose it would be the one who was forgiven more. And Jesus says, ding, 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 we've got a winner, Simon. That is exactly right. You've hit the nail right on the head. If somebody is forgiven of more, then they obviously will love more. And that brings us to verses 44 through 50. Jesus brings all this home. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house... You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she hasn't ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at table with him began to ask amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, 
Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I love this exchange. This is amazing. He says, Simon, do you see this woman standing here? And Simon must have thought, what a ridiculous question. How could I not see this woman? Of course I see her. She's ruined my dinner party. and She's embarrassed me. I invited you here to show off a little bit. And this sinful woman has messed up everything. Of course I see this woman. But he didn't see her. Not really. Not the way Jesus saw her. He only saw her for what she had done. Her past, her mistakes, not who she really was. Simon didn't see a person created in the image of God. He only saw a sinner. And then Jesus listed off all the things that Simon had failed to do for him. Uh, The very things that were expected of a host. Simon hadn't given him any water for his feet to be washed. Simon hadn't greeted him with a kiss. Simon certainly didn't anoint his head with oil. But this sinful woman had washed his feet with her own hair and tears. She had still not ceased to kiss uh, kissing his feet. She even anointed his feet with expensive ointment. And then Jesus brought it all home. He said, yes, this woman is a sinner. And, And her sins are many. Make no mistake about it. Jesus did not once excuse her sin. He acknowledged it. But he said, because she had shown such great love, I will show her great forgiveness. What a shock that must have been to everybody there. They began to marvel. I imagine they had to pick their jaws up off the ground. They started to say, who is this that could even forgive sins? And then Jesus turned directly toward this woman and talked to her for the first time that night. And he said what had to be the sweetest word she had ever heard in her life. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Wow. This sinful woman who had just the worst reputation around town came to Jesus and instead of finding condemnation, she found compassion. What kind of courage do you think it took this woman to enter the home of that Pharisee that night? That was a pretty brave thing to do, I think. She knew her sin. She was well aware of it. She knew that everyone knew her sin. And she knew that all eyes were going to be glued to her that night. She had to feel so out of place. Like she didn't belong. It was an uncomfortable situation. There's no doubt about it. Now, tonight, you are here on a Wednesday night for a summer series lesson. I know what that means. I know the audience that's here tonight. That probably means you're a church regular, that you're here every time the door is open. I love that. I'm so thankful that you are, if you are. But you know, sometimes, even those of us who are here so often might feel a little bit out of place, almost like we don't really belong. Maybe, just maybe, Sometimes you think back to all the mistakes you've made in your life, and there have been many of them, no doubt. And there's this little nagging voice in the back of your head that says, you don't really belong here. Not really. You're not good enough. You're not as good as all these other people. You're the only one that's struggling with sin. Nobody else. It's just you. You know, we have this bad habit of comparing ourselves to others. We can look around at all these other good church people and we can think, oh, they've got it all together. They're not struggling with anything. I'm the only one having a hard time. I'm the only one dealing with temptation. I'm the only one that makes these kinds of mistakes over and over again. And if we're not careful, we can start to think that we don't belong here. And maybe that's where you're at tonight. Maybe that's somebody here tonight. And maybe it takes courage for you to come to church like this because you just feel like you don't quite belong. Well, tonight, I want you to know that just like this sinful woman in Luke chapter 7, you are exactly where you need to be tonight. This right here. 
the Green Forest Church of Christ is exactly where you need to be. Because you have come into the presence of the Lord. Do you realize that? He's here. He's present. And he is beckoning you to lay all of your burdens down at his feet. All your past, all your mistakes, everything. He wants to take it all. He is offering you mercy. He is offering you grace. Forgiveness. He's offering you compassion. If you will just come to him in love, with a broken heart, like like this sinful woman did, he will forgive. He promises he will, and he is so good to his promises. It doesn't matter what you've done. No sin is too great. It doesn't matter where you've been. No, No past is too dark. His forgiveness is for anybody who will seek it. Every single person. Now, don't misunderstand me. Forgiveness requires a change. Of course it does. It it requires repentance. Uh, In Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell you, unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. And and most of the times in the Gospels, when he does forgive a person of their sins, remember, he'll tell them to go and sin no more. That means repentance. So, of course, forgiveness demands repentance. But forgiveness is ultimately found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. No amount of repenting, no no amount of good works, good deeds could take away your sin. It's only the blood of Christ that could do that. Uh, Ephesians 1.7 says, In Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his uh, his grace. Uh, Matthew 26.28, Jesus said, For this is the blood, uh, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And of course, Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So look, I I don't know your life. Some of you I know by name. Most of you I don't even know back. So I don't know what your past has looked like. I don't know what kind of sin has been in your life or might even still be in your life. But I know you have it. I know you have it. And like this woman, your sin is great. Your your sins are many. But Jesus offers compassion. He is willing to forgive it all. Every single sin. Yes, even that one that you're still holding on to. He forgives it all. There was a a church out in California, and in this congregation was a a small little family, a single mother who had three children, uh, all of which were born out of wedlock. And this mother really struggled with guilt and shame over her decisions. But she and her kids had found the courage to start attending this church. It wasn't easy, but they stuck with it. And eventually it started to feel at home in this church. Well, one Sunday there was a guest preacher who talked that morning about sexual sin. Now, of course, that topic needs to be addressed sometimes. It's biblical. But the problem was that this preacher was very, very condemning. There was no compassion at all in his lesson. He was one of those hellfire and brimstone type. Adam, you're a hellfire and brimstone type, right? Yeah, probably not. I don't, I don't get that sense. And look, there's a time and a place for that. Of course there is. But it has to be measured against the overarching story of Scripture, which is, you know, that whole for God so loved the world thing. It has to be measured against that. Well, this morning it wasn't. There was no talk of love, no mention of grace, no compassion. Only what this preacher described as the inevitability of punishment for sins like this. Now, the regular preacher of that church knew this woman and her kids were in attendance that day. He was really uncomfortable with this sermon, just wondering how it made her feel. He was squirming around in his seat. He was honestly relieved when it was finally over Uh, he had to get up and give the invitation song but while he did it he noticed the woman and her kids weren't there anymore so as soon as the song was finished uh, before the even the last prayer was even said he bolted out the back door to go find this woman and her three children they were walking home in the pouring rain he caught up to them flagged them down and when she turned around he noticed the tears just streaming down this young woman's face 
She just shook her head and she said that she was, she was just beyond all hope because of what she had done and that she just didn't belong there. He said, no, you've got it all wrong. You are not beyond all hope. You are God's creation and his grace is far greater than any of your mistakes. And so this preacher stood in the pouring rain, the mud and the muck, hugging this little family, praying for them, and really loving them, showing them real compassion. Now, I don't know who that preacher was. I don't even know his name. But I can tell you that he was so much like Jesus in that moment, wasn't he? He was loving. He was compassionate. Well, our Lord stands with you in the mud and the muck, embracing you, loving you, and telling you that you are not beyond hope. He says, you are mine. I purchased you, and my grace is far, far greater than any of your mistakes. So tonight, if you need to, Will you come to him just like this sinful woman did in Luke chapter 7 with a broken heart? Will you come to him in love? Will you come to him in repentance? And will you hear him say those sweetest words? Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Because that is the offer that's made to you tonight. Nothing less. God's infinite love Grace, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. Tonight, if you need to come to this Savior through faith, through repentance, and have your sins washed away in baptism, oh, what a night it would be to make that commitment. We would love to help you begin that brand new journey with Christ, to have the slate wiped clean, brand new, a new creation, completely 100% forgiven. So tonight, if you need that, we want to help. Or, or maybe you made that decision a long, long time ago. But life hasn't quite gone the way that you wanted it to go. Maybe some, sin has come back into the picture and it has come back with a vengeance. Tonight, you need to let go of all that and come back to him all over again. Tonight, if we can help you in any way, I want you to know just how much this church loves you. I know that they do and they would do anything to help you. So tonight, if you have need, please come forward as we stand and we sing.
you would bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to gather as your church, humbled by the blessings that you bestowed upon us and grateful for the work that you do in our lives. We're thankful for the message we were able to hear tonight and we ask that you continue to work on those little sins in our lives that we are trying to tuck away and hide, but we know that you see them, and we know that um, we need to do better in your sight. We know that there are, there are those that weren't able to be with us tonight due to health reasons or spiritual reasons. We just ask that you be with them, bless them, and those attending to them. Be with us as we go through this week that we may draw closer to you, become stronger Christians, and expand your body. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 